truth and your predictions turn out to be right, they tend to believe you the next time. Right? Whereas the government was telling them things that were false, we kept demonstrating that they were false. That thing about building a desk cracker, it's a, it's a piece of machinery that cracks a code that the government said couldn't be cracked. Right? The, the head of the FBI and the deputy, term, uh, deputy head of the National Security Agency went in front of Congress in a closed classified session and told these guys these codes cannot be cracked. We need to have laws that will that will force people to give up their keys. You know, for, force people to give up their privacy because if we seize evidence that's encrypted with this, we can't crack it. Either they were completely incompetent or they were lying through their teeth because I took $250,000 and built a machine that in a week cracks that code. <laughs> and published it in a book that they couldn't suppress, and, and their policy changed a year later because they just, nobody would believe their pronouncements anymore that the sky would fall. So, so the truth is a powerful aid, not just in dealing with the government, but in dealing with the public. I mean, if you establish a reputation for credibility, then the public will understand that the lies they hear over and over from the dare people and Louis Free of the FBI and all these other people are lies and that what they've been hearing from us well, if it's lies then they don't know who to trust but if it's truth then they'll go with us okay uh, another thing that we have tended to do is, is we don't play to win right we're so beaten down by this whole thing that we've become the loyal opposition, right? We all come to, look, look at this. How many people are here working on drug law reform, right? Uh, we, we sort of fill a small conference room, you know, in a, in a large hotel, right? We, um, we're uh, demoralized and we, we don't give credence to the other side, we just sort of reduce to, to deciding that the whole thing is hopeless, but we're gonna, you know, we're gonna give it one last stand just so that the truth will be out there even when we lose. Well, this is crazy, we should play to win. Right? Well, if everyone in this room is here to win, well, I, Maybe I shouldn't be naming names of people who aren't here, but I talked to Julie Stewart of the Families Against Mandatory Minimums. She split off from the Cato Institute almost a decade ago, founded an organization whose job it was to get rid of mandatory minimum sentences. It's been a decade. We still have lots of mandatory minimum sentences. I said, what would it take to get rid of mandatory minimum sentences? How much money, how much time, what's the strategy, how many different avenues would you have to try, right? She has yet to get back to me with a plan, right? When did you ask her? Oh, I asked her three or four months ago, right? Who here has a plan, right? What, I, what, I'm, what I'm hearing from folks is, well, we know what the public will vote for, so let's put that in front of them. Well, that's not much of a plan, right? The question is, how do we convince the public to vote for the right thing? Right, well, yeah, buy, no, I mean, you guys will get your chance in a minute. Um, buying TV time might be a good thing, but we need to figure out what the message is. You know, there's, there's lots of work to be done there. Okay, so, so, so play to win, right? I'm, I come at this as a businessman and a civil libertarian, and I come at it from an attitude of, you set your goals, you work out a strategy, you have a couple of backup strategies, and you go, you go full speed ahead on the strategies, and the stuff that works, you keep doing, and the stuff that doesn't work, you discard and try something else, and you keep going until you hit it, right? And that's, that's my approach. But, but like Ira Glasser was saying, you don't lose sight of the goal when, when micromanaging your way down the victories.